Okay, good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6. So this will be the final in the 1 Timothy series. 1 Timothy 6. Okay, so 1 Timothy 6. This is continuing in the theme and his commands to believers within the church, which we saw in chapter 3, that if I tarry long that thou mayest not of the, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the church, which is uh, in, the, in the house of God, uh, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of the ground of the truth. And then he spends basically the rest of the book giving command. Uh, and this week... We're looking at specific commands that were given in chapter 6. So chapter 6 starts out with regard to commands to servants. Servants. And we see here, verse 1, let as, many as, uh, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine uh, be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So the first thing we see is with regard to how to behave servant to master, servant to master. Now he's speaking here with regard to those that are enslaved. They're, they're literally bond slaves or either bought slaves, regardless of which one of the two they're, they're in slavery. Uh, we don't necessarily have that in U.S. society present day, so we, the best correlation that we would have would be just uh, employer to employee, or rather employee to employer. Um, but here's the attitude that he gives. Uh, esteem your master. Esteem your master. So he says there that they are to count worthy of all honor. Count worthy of all honor. In other words, they're supposed to esteem them highly. Um, and he gives a reason here. He says that uh, the word of God, and or excuse me, the name of God and doctrine of God be not blasphemed. Okay, so um, included in this, as far as that you're supposed to, because he addresses also believing uh, individuals. Uh, in verse two, uh, they that have believing masters. So in other words, if your master is a believer. He tells them not to despise them uh, because they're a brother, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. And that these things command, uh, uh, teach and exhort. Um, as somebody that is under authority, if you're employed by somebody, or if even in the case if you were somebody's slave, uh, the fact is I don't, <laughs> I don't have the right to look down upon my master or actually think lowly of them or actually... Uh, want to obviously I mean out of curiosity has anybody here ever been enslaved like you were somebody's property where you didn't really have say over your own body you didn't have to say over what you did what you said uh, your living conditions or anything okay so it's it's kind of difficult to relate with regard to that but um, regardless of whether the person was unsaved or saved uh, I am not supposed to hate that condition, but rather I should uh, do the service, the believing ones, and as well as I am supposed to uh, serve them, uh, particularly enthusiastically. Okay, uh, We get that as well from Colossians, where Paul wrote to the Church of Colossae uh, that they're supposed to serve God. Uh, and then that they're supposed to please their masters, not with eye service, being as men please respect, as it is in truth that they are serving the living God. So in other words, God is the one that establishes authority. God's the one that has allowed you to be in that position. And the fact is that if I am under authority, God's created authority structure on earth. And so I'm not to despise it, uh, but rather I'm supposed to uh, do service to the ones that are believing, obviously do service to the ones that are unbelieving as well, 
uh, but in particular because God's word will be blasphemed. Uh, he gives a warning here, and that is that a bad attitude will reflect on the Lord. A bad attitude is going to reflect on the Lord, and that's what that comes out with regard to. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to comment there that we all have, we all are servants, every one of us. Yes. Uh, even President Trump, he's a servant to the people, and he has to answer to the people for what he does. Uh, I've been a boss. I've been been working under many bosses, and we can relate this this this. Servant to master relates to every one of us in, in some position or another. Yes, that's true. Um, you just brought a scripture to mind with regard to that. Is that Jesus, when he spoke to uh, the disciples, this is still while uh, he was still alive and accompanying with them, and that James and John asked, you know, can, can, you know, when we come into the kingdom, can we sit in your right hand and your left hand? And then Jesus says to them, well, it's not mine to give. You know, but rather the Father, but those that would be the greatest uh, are to be the least. So in other words, they that are to be great in the kingdom of God are going to be servant of all. And so the, um, and the same way that Jesus Christ came to serve uh, and he gave his life a ransom is the same way that we're supposed to emulate. So God's idea of greatness is obviously way different from what man considers. And that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Everybody is on their authority. Uh, even, even a master, uh, and so you might look at the boss and say, "Hey," but the fact is, they're responsible for everybody that would be under them, and they have some measure of authority over them as well that, they, that they're accountable to. Nobody's above the law per se or uh, without accountability. Thank you. That's a good point. Uh, but our attitude, our disposition with regard to our state, uh, with regard to how we carry out our responsibilities and our duties. Uh, is going to reflect a lot. And the thing is, we have the name of God on us uh, as believers. And so how we carry about our responsibilities, uh, how we go about fulfilling our duty, um, is going to reflect on God and is going to reflect on his teaching. And so the thing is, most... I should put this up here. Um, there was a meme I saw on, on Facebook uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a little silly, but uh, the meme goes basically there's two people having a discussion. So one man is he's like a believer and then he's t speaking to the Lord. And then he says something along the lines of, uh, you know, do you think I should put the, the fish symbol on my, on my business card to indicate that I'm a Christian? And then, you know, and then Jesus asks him, well, well to what extent? You know, what, in other words, what would be the purpose of that? You know, so that, it, and then he's like, well, it would seem, you know, pretty reasonable that so that people would know I'm a Christian. And then Jesus responds to him, well, how about doing your duties in, you know, in a diligent manner and then, in other words, displaying it by, more by your character and your integrity than it is just by showing the symbol. Well, I, the point being is that um, as believers, uh, well, we're even told in, in John's 14, 15, and 16, uh, by this shall men know that you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. Uh, and so there's things that are going to reflect uh, God's true nature and true character in how we carry ourselves, our behavior, our mentality, our, our mindset, um, the, our speech, everything about our conduct. And that should be the mitigating factor, the controlling factor in our life because uh, we do carry the name of God. We're ambassadors for Christ. And how we represent Him uh, greatly affects whether or not people are going to be drawn towards him or repelled or going to be drawn away. In other words, they're, they're going to not want to have anything to do. They're going to say, well, you know, my experience with believers has been, and then they go X, Y, Z of all these negative things. And so we shouldn't have a bad attitude. Uh, that's going to reflect on that. And then, uh, sounds funny, but this is true. Brethren have privilege. He says it here with regard to, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, but rather um, do them service. And the reason why is because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. In other words, they're a believer. Uh, we're told, actually, Paul writes later on that uh, to remind the believers uh, to do good, uh, and especially to them that are of the household of faith. And the uh, reason being is, uh, again, 
by this shaman, or if you, uh, if you're my, that you're my disciples, if you have love one toward another. Uh, so we we do have privilege. It's not to say that God doesn't lean upon the unjust as well. He does. He's good to all, but uh, believers do have privilege. And then uh, rejection of the truth is opposition to Christ. And that goes without saying. And we start that with verse 3. It says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the whole, even the words of, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, and doting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, okay, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Okay, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. And then he's going to go off on uh, explaining with regard to this mentality of what true godliness is and what true true gain is rather than what the world uh, considers gain. Uh, but a person that would be opposed to the teaching. Now what was the teaching? He, he literally just stated it. What was, what was the teaching? In other words, do service to your masters. Don't, don't, uh, in other words, um, in order for the word of God not to be blasphemed more in his doctrine, um, you're supposed to count your masters of all honor. Um, count them worthy of all honor. And then the believing masters um, that uh, don't despise them, but rather do them service. So in other words, most people would have an attitude that would want to, you know, buck against authority and say, hey, well, I'm, you know, I'm not your slave or whatever, something along those lines. Uh, but the fact is, um, you know, they have a, a mentality that is based on covetousness and greed. And he's going to later explain that here. So anybody that would fight against or argue against or speak against what God's teaching, uh, you know, obviously submission to authority, uh, following God's command. Uh, and then he goes on here and explains as well as contentment. Uh, then that person is, we're told here, proud, knows nothing doting about questions and strifes of words, and then um, somebody from whom we should withdraw ourselves. Okay, contentment. Contentment and godliness are more valuable than monetary gain. Um, verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Um, here's why, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out, and in having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Uh, let us be therewith content. Okay. But they that will be rich, uh, fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Uh, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, uh, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Um, covetousness and greed bring pain and heartache and destruction and then contentment and godliness are more valuable uh, than monetary gain. Is it wrong to desire something more for yourself? Is it wrong to be ambitious, honestly? No. That's not what he's saying here. He's not saying that you can't have a desire for something greater. That doesn't mean that you can't exercise yourself towards, you know, a greater ambition uh, with, really with regard to anything. Um, but he's speaking here of what he calls a temptation and a snare. He uh, says, they that will be rich, they that will be rich, okay, those that desire to be rich, uh, fall into temptation and a snare, then into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Okay, uh, go back to verse 7. Uh, it says, For we brought nothing into this world, and in a certain we can carry nothing out. Then having food and raiment, uh, let us therewith be content. Um, this is parallel, we see, in Hebrews 13. Go to Hebrews 13 real quick, and then we'll turn right back. Hebrews 13, verse 5. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness, 
and then be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave you, or never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Now, if he's speaking of this is God, Jesus, having said this. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And he gives an explanation here. He says, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. All right, so let's analyze this just grammatically. Uh, Jesus said, I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. And then he gives a command here, let your conversation be without covetousness, and then be content with such things as you have. And the reason why is because he says, I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. And in verse 6, uh, so that we could boldly say, the Lord is my helper. If God is helping me, what is the implication of that? I need help. Okay. If God's helping me, it's because I need help. In other words, I, I'm appealing to God for help, so he's helping me. Um, and then, that I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Um, if I'm to be content, if I am to be uh, not covetousness, not covetous. Now, covetous has the idea of basically you're looking towards something that doesn't belong to you. Uh, that's not to say that you're not looking forward towards something or having goals in mindset, but rather, uh, for me, the easiest way to understand it is uh, either you're single or married. Either condition it, it applies. You look towards somebody else's wife, right? Uh, and you say, "Well, why is why is she with that person? She belongs with me." And so you desire her. And well, God's very clear on that as far as what that would be. That's uh, adultery, right? So, well, it is adultery. I'm not, I mean, that is that's a rhetorical question. It is adultery. Okay, so. You look at that, and that's, okay, obviously very wrong, uh, according to God. Well, the same applies with regard to, you can say, any number of things, not just strictly to that, but that's the clearest thing as far as that's pretty evident, self-evident. Uh, rather than looking towards your neighbor's wife, you can say, well, you know what, God, you're able to provide me with a wife. Uh, and then you trust God to provide you with your wife and that applies with every other thing in other words you can look towards something wow that would be kind of neat to have uh, as opposed to looking at it and say well that belongs to me I need to have that I want that uh, and the thing is you seek God for it rather than going about and trying to steal it for yourself in other words that's not yours that's not your allotment that's not what belongs to you you'd be a thief in a sense, as opposed to just seeking God for it, having God provide it and go about the means for which God allowed for um, you to be able to acquire something. Does it make sense? In other words, you, you know, you don't, um, so my condition, I'm in need of something. So I seek God for it and then he aids me, he helps me. Now that would imply that I would be in a position of need. Okay, so that it doesn't say how prolonged it would be, uh, and even to what degree that need would be. But nevertheless, I'm supposed to be contentment because that reflects on the fact that <laughs> God wants to use that to influence and impact other people. When they look to me and they say, "Well, how is it that you know you're satisfied or you're uh, content with where you're at?" It's well because God's my helper. You know, in other words, he provides. He's given me ability to be able to go ahead and, you know, uh, make gain, uh, to be able to receive whatever it is that you're blessed with, and so on and so forth. So in other words, I point to God because he's actually ultimately the provider. And then uh, go back to First Timothy 6. Um, this kind of falls in into the warning as well that he gives towards uh, individuals 
that um, verse 17. Okay, so verse 17, he says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. All right, God's the provider. Uh, now, you may have had uh, a lot of diligence exerted and exercised. You might have uh, disciplined yourself and so forth. That's not to take away from the effort that you put forth to be able to get gain. But ultimately, it's God that is the one that's providing. Uh, okay, so alternatives to covetousness and greed. Uh, pursue the eternal rather than the temporal. And then pursue integrity and character. Verse 7. Or excuse me. Um, yeah, verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world we can, and certainly we can carry. Uh, oh, sorry. Verse 11. Verse 11. <laughs> But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And then fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Okay. Fight the good fight of faith, and then flee the covetousness, but follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. These all have to deal with your character, with your integrity. Um, so how do you fight that? How do you, how do you uh, avoid being a covetous person? Um, you develop character, or you pursue character. You, you seek to develop character, even to a greater degree than what you've already attained. Okay. And then commands for the wealthy. Uh, that is, we just touched on that in verse 17 that they be not high minded so in other words be humble nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things so joy uh, trust God and not your wisdom or your wealth <coughs> now he gives a purpose here with regard to uh, them how they should use their wealth is that, that they do good that they be rich in good works ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Uh, and that is summed up is be generous and then use your wealth for God's glory. In other words, God's allowed you to be able to go ahead and have that. Mind you, he stated here, um, God giveth us richly all things to enjoy. It's not sinful to enjoy no, the fruit of your labor is not sinful to enjoy wealth. It's not sinful to enjoy blessing. Okay, uh, where it deviates is where that becomes your purpose and your focus as opposed to just, uh, you know, having your character and integrity be more of a focus or having that which is eternal be focused as opposed to, uh, um, or rather I should say, excuse me, I said that wrong. Having the temporal be the focus as opposed to the eternal. Uh, so, be a generous individual. Seek to be a generous individual. Use your wealth for God's glory. And then, now these are, in summary, just commands to Timothy that were given. Overall, be faithful. Now he was told in verses. Verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things, and before uh, Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witness a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now which command? Follow after righteousness. Flee those things uh, with regard to the covetousness, the greed. Uh, to go ahead and actually put them in remembrance as far as how to behave. And then as well, uh, verse 20, where it says, Keep that which is committed unto thy trust, uh, avoiding a pro uh, profane and vain babblings in opposition to science falsely so-called. 
uh, with some having, some professing have erred concerning the faith. Uh, so be faithful. Be faithful to the things that you've been entrusted to. Be faithful to follow that which you've been taught. Okay. Uh, avoid negative influences. Uh, pursue integrity and character. And then live in pursuit of the eternal. So that's in summary. And then Jesus' words still ring true today. And this is from Mark chapter 8. If you want, we can turn there. Well, actually, go ahead and turn there real quick. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Read verse 36 and 37 because that's what I put up there, and that is, For what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, which is a good question. I, I, uh, I'm sure many of us have, we've used this quite often for when we go soul winning. Uh, go to verse 27 just so we can establish a context. This is Jesus actually speaking to disciples or those who are following him. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, or Elijah. And others say, One of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him and began to teach them uh, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him. Now the idea there is he took him aside and began to rebuke him, like as if to... took him aside to, for privacy's sake and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, that's Jesus... So Peter takes him aside to go rebuke him with regard to how is it that you're going to die? You're not going to die. Um, and uh, Jesus waited. He turned about and looked on his disciples. And then he rebuked Peter, like openly before everybody, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Uh, now, what would that be? I mean, they're following Christ. They've left all. They're seeking to, I guess you could say, establish a kingdom, or waiting for him to establish a kingdom. They believe on him already as Messiah. He's the one sent to be able to go ahead and he's got to come and rule Israel. So he's looking forward to, but he's he's looking forward to future promise, but as well as denying the fact that's very clearly stated in Daniel nine and Isaiah 53 as well, that Messiah would be cut off uh, for the sins of the people. And uh, anyway, so he says here, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, for thou savorest not the, morning, uh, not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. All right, so God's will for him was what? He was to be cut off. He was to die for the sins of the people. That's why Christ came to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, and Peter's like, no, that can't be. Huh. Uh, and then when he had called, now who had called? That's Jesus. In other words, Jesus had called uh, the people unto him with his disciples also. He sent unto them, the entire group together now of all the people that are there as well as the disciples, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then for whosoever shall uh, will save his life shall lose his life, or shall lose it, for whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. And then for what shall a proper man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whatsoever there or whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this gen adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. 
when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So, this is open rebuke. Now you have a mixture of people there, because he says when he's called the people to himself, along with his disciples that were following him, and some of which already had it clearly expressed, hey, specifically Peter, you know, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. His point being is that uh, you live for self, your life is a waste. You live for God, there's value to it. In other words, you have gain, eternal gain. Uh, I know we usually also, uh, we often use it in reference to the fact that, you know, salvation, he's actually speaking to them with regard to Christian walk. Uh, though there is a salvation application to it, but it's primarily his disciples were the ones that were there. Um, though not exclusively. And that is that uh, if you live for now, it's a wasted life. You live for the temporal things, again, it's wasted life. Uh, so you're better off exchanging, well, as he says here, uh, deny yourself and take up your cross. In Luke, he says it, take up your cross daily. Uh, in other words, if you're going to have something before which you can stand, when you stand before God, to hear well done, it would be losing your life for his sake and the gospel's doesn't necessarily mean that martyrdom is going to be in store, but rather that you spend your life living for God rather than living for self. And God's values and man's values obviously are pretty different. He expressed that when he says to Peter, you know, you don't savor the things that be of God, but rather the things of man. And so we should heed his warning and we should heed the example and we should heed the teaching that he had given, uh, not only here, but also later on to Paul, uh, to give to Timothy, who was at the church at Ephesus, to charge them on how to behave. And that is that uh, integrity and character are of more value, and rather than, than having uh, temporal gain, seek to have eternal gain. In other words, uh, live with a life that is in pursuit of the eternal. Matthew chapter 6, and we're finished. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Uh, you cannot serve God and mammon. And then, Verse 33, I know we're skipping a lot. <laughs> uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Uh, there's other portions of scripture. Uh, Colossians, you know, seek, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth, because our, our life is hid with Christ and God. So the thing is, as, you know, well, <laughs> he's speaking to Timothy as a man of God, but we should all seek to strive to be men of God. And then as well, women, that's not exclusive as far as, well, women can't pastor, but as far as they can still develop that same measure of integrity and character. Uh, and that is that uh, we should follow after righteousness, uh, godliness, uh, faith, meekness and not have that pursuit of the temporal. Is there any questions? Okay. Not where it's best. Thank you.
чемпион. 